Greetings, welcome, and good day. You are now tuned into the ninth episode of the Season Vet Podcast. I'm so happy you could make it to another chapter of this show. This week, we're joined by an Army sergeant who is not to be played with. Unlike most who joined the military, today's guest was married with two children before she decided to enlist in the Army at 23 years old. Because she joined the Army with more life experience than most recruits, it was hard for anyone to just push her around, drill sergeants included. Because of this, the boot camp motto of break them down to build them up simply did not work with her. Some of her most surprising life lessons have come from her time serving as a food inspector on active duty. Most of the interviews I've done have been with Navy and Coast Guard veterans. This is the first Army veteran I've had the chance to sit down with. And that's why I've named this episode Army of One. Friend! <laughs> How's it going? Pretty good. How's your day been so far? It's been good. Was the uh, timing okay? I know I shifted it back a little bit, but I'm sorry about that. Oh, no, it's been fine. Just had to knock out some things, but... Right on. I just want to say that uh, the weather here is especially bad, and I blame the Army for that. The Army? <laughs> I blame your whole branch. <laughs> I blame the Navy at her Coast Guard. <laughs> Y'all stay here longer. <laughs> Fine, we'll take it. <laughs> so, what is your connection to the service? Um, I'm in the Army. Mm -hmm. How long have you been in? Seven years next month. Right on, right on. And do you have any family in the service? No, not anymore. I had an uncle that was Air Force and a couple cousins in the Navy. Right on. I mean, I'm only asking because, like, a lot of times when people join the Navy, I'm sorry, when people join the military, it's because they grew up in, like, a, a military family. Like, they got some exposure to it early on. So, like, you don't get a lot of people that are, like, first-generation military people, unless they're, from what I recently learned, uh, foreigners. But so my ex-husband was in, and his parents were in also. Mm -hmm. And when I joined, I was still married, so. Right on, right on. It was kind of, that was my connection. Well, you better get that BAH. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, was the Army your first choice? It was not. It was not. What was your Air Force choice? was my first choice, but since he was still in, yeah. when I joined, we're like the MACP Mary Ar Army Couples Program. Mm -hmm. That's what we're shooting for, but we didn't make it that long. Sorry to hear that. So the Air Force was your first choice. I get that. Like, you know what? A lot of people say that. I wanted it easy, easy twenty years. You think the Air Force has it easy? I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna tell all the Air Force people. You say, "Hey, Air Force people. Hey, she thinks she thinks y'all got it easy now." The ones I speak to say it's easy. <laughs> she said, "Y'all over here playing video games." <laughs> Inside condition buildings. Inside condition. <laughs> you know, Air Force food is top-notch gourmet cooking. It's, it's really delicious. Y'all get paid extra to be on our installations. <laughs> so we know y'all are living better. <laughs> she said, y'all, like, I'm still in the Air Force. Y'all, I'm Coast Guard. <laughs> I don't get it that good anymore. <laughs> so how do you feel about your time in uniform so far? Like, does any particular period stand out? I think for the most part, I enjoy it. Like, I enjoy waking up, you know, doing PT. What? Um, Hold on. on. Don't send that message, man. We don't want people to think that it's okay to wake up and do exercises. No, I'm I, dead I think it keeps you motivated, <laughs> keeps you energized. But um, it's times where it's just annoying. But for the most part, like, I, I like waking up, you know, ironing my uniform, putting it on, the going structure. to work. Yeah. And I got an easy job, so. What it's is your job, structure. if you don't mind my asking? I'm a food inspector. Come on. Yo, you are incredibly important. <laughs> That's the first time I heard that. <laughs> no, look, I'm, I feel like I'm talking to the FDA right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it feels like. They're scared when we come in the building. Look, you're an important lady. I'm glad that they're scared because they know they got to act right. How do you feel your uh, time in service, your experience so far, could have been improved or could be improved? I think more mature leadership, because I feel like people get promoted a lot faster than they should, and then these are the people that we have to look up to and, you know, get guidance from, yeah. and they still need guidance. <laughs> so I think that no, that's is probably the worst part. The immature leadership. That's, mm -hmm. You know, immature is the nicest way I've heard uh, leadership being described from some of my interviews. Usually it's just bad leadership or shitty leadership, but, like, immature, that's a very nice description like you got, I think I think it's the manners. most accurate description <laughs> to give because I mean daily speaking my mind you know at work 
Yeah. That's not the word that I use, but in all reality, that's what it is. Like, you know, people are joining fresh out of high school, mm -hmm. and they didn't really get the, I wouldn't say the correct upbringing, but they didn't get the best upbringing mm -hmm. where they have a mature mindset. And the Army just kind of throw it on you, and it's like, all right, do this, and do this, and do this, and handle this, but and what time are ways. they getting to develop? So I think maturity plays a big part in proper leadership. I love that. So as a food inspector, have you ever been, how do I say this, a chef, a cook? Uh, have you ever been, a, we call them culinary specialists in the Coast Guard. Have you ever uh, had to prepare food as well? No, that, so that's a different MOS. So we have 92 Gulfs. So that's our uh, culinary specialist. Mm -hmm. But we inspect the facilities that they work in. Okay. So for the most part, no. We don't cook anything. I think the only thing we actually get close to cooking are rations, like UGRAs. Mm -hmm. We'll cook those to make sure that they're good to be extended or pushed out. Right on. But even then, we probably get somebody else to prepare it. It's somebody else's job. If it's somebody else's job, it's just somebody else's job. Good. And you said this was an easy job? It's easy-ish. I think for comfort comfortability, it is, it's an easy job. Like, oh. we, we're not outside. We're not depending on if you're MTO or TDA. TDA is more so, you know. Mm -hmm. We're doing our job daily. I do my job daily. I did that at my last duty station. So I wouldn't say it's cake, but compared to other MOSs in the Army, we got it good. You're not lifting uh, trucks for a living or playing with trucks for a living? No. <laughs> I, was, I mean, the closest we get to, you know, moving things around is rearranging a room that has things in it, <laughs> unnecessary things. But oh, yes. it's not a back-breaking job. It's pretty simple. Tell me about a time when you experienced something, either good or bad, that you know was unique to you because you are a black woman. Good or bad, it doesn't matter. Like, sometimes you get treated nicely because you're a black lady. I think, for me, like, starting from basic training, there's kind of like a stigma with, uh, you know, I guess, like, younger black women and older black women. Like, it, mm -hmm. it always seems like there's a divide there. But coming to, I guess, this duty station is where I realize that I have the opportunity to change that stigma. Because right. in basic, I went through it with every black leader I I went like anyone I encountered. Get into it. AIT the same thing. Like it's they always see us like it seems like it's a competition where they have to like bring us down because they feel like it's a possibility we'll have an attitude or whatever. But um, here I have a lot of you know black soldiers, female soldiers, mm -hmm. and they said the same thing. Like hey, like anywhere I've went, any black leader, it always felt like it was tug and pull, tug and pull. But I was able to you know change their mindset on that. So. I think that's the most positive experience I had being a black woman in the military. I love this answer because it's nuanced. So the, the difference between the older black lady soldiers and the younger black lady soldiers, would you say it's a difference of uh, maybe conservatism on the uh, older black ladies? Or is this actual, like, are they looking at you as actual competition? Or, I think, like, where is it coming from? Like, what, I think, what do you think honestly, is? it's their upbringing. Like, oh. it's, at some point, I feel like, you know, the cycle has to be broken. But I feel like it's their upbringing. There was, you know, tug and pull when they were coming up. Mm -hmm. And that's just the mindset they have. They have that, I guess, older mindset, older Army mindset, where it's like, oh, we got to be tough on you because at this age, this is what I was doing. So it's just... Would you say you had it tougher from your black lady leaders than maybe any other Democrat? Oh, most definitely. Wow. Most definitely. Wow. Most definitely. And once again, I love these answers because they're nuanced. Uh, I wasn't expecting that. So if you don't mind, let's kind of get into it a little bit. Okay. So so they, they're tough on you because someone else was tough on them. I mean, so I feel like in basic training, the, the answer I got, it wasn't the answer, but the like the reason I got for how, I wouldn't say I was treated badly because, I mean, I'm not, I didn't come in weak or young, you know. I came in. I was already a mother, I was married, mm -hmm. out of high school for years, but the answer that I got was, I see myself in you. Oh my God, I've heard this before. Yeah, <laughs> like, I see myself in you, so I feel like I need to do this to mentor you, but instead of saying, like, they wanted to mentor me or they wanted to guide me, it was like, I see myself in you, so I'm going to stay on top of you. But it's, the, it's always the approach. Do you, you think know? it came from a place of love at all with any of them? I, I do feel like... A lot of people come into the Army trying to, I guess, like, mold people because they, it's, they're passionate about molding people. But then I don't think it came for a place of love. Like, it was just, like, boot camp is to break you down, to make mm -hmm. you disciplined. It's 
to instill discipline. Right. So right. it was that day one, they were like, you have no discipline. We're going to break you. Wow. So no matter how much discipline you kind of already had, even as a civilian, like their goal is to... To break you. <laughs> oh, man. To mold you. I, I guess that's the, the drill sergeant way, to mold you. They're there to mold you. So you had black lady drill sergeants or a black lady drill sergeant? I had three. Wow. I didn't even know that many numbers was available. For drill? Yeah. Oh, most definitely. I came from through a, a Coast Guard boot camp. Like, I was hard-pressed to see anybody that looked like me. So at your first duty station, after, uh, after you got out of boot camp, were you under the leadership of a black lady? Or and did you work with any black women? My first duty station, I think maybe eight months later, I had my first black woman leader, I guess. I don't know if I can really throw her into this because she was just socially awkward. She just <laughs> There was no social skills okay. there whatsoever. So not a lot of interactions with her? She was never over me directly, okay. but she was the only black leader we had. Okay. Makes sense. Wow. Hey, thank you for the, these answers, man. This is very real. When you bring up things to your chain of command, do you feel like you're being heard? Or have you had to bring up anything to your chain of command? Any, it, any complaints, anything? I guess it just it just depends on what's being brought up. Some things, like, you know, they get worked on then, and some things, it takes time. What would you say gets the most hesitation or the most procrastination? What kind of things would you bring up to your chain of command that they just kind of drag their feet on a little? That's some timey, too. I guess it, it depends on... So typically, I'm bringing things up to my chain of command. It has to deal with a soldier issue that they have, but it depends on how many issues this soldier has, if that makes sense. Does that make sense to you? Oh, a little bit. Like, if it's constantly, forward. like, they got this, and they got this, and they got this, and they got this. So you're in a like... supervising uh, position, so when you're talking to somebody over here, you're talking about somebody lower ranking than you. For the most part, yeah. Okay. Like, okay. trying to see what guidance I can get for this issue, for the soldier, figuring things out. But I think for the most part, it's it's some timing. It just it honestly it just depends on the person, like or how the information is passed. Like if I talk to them directly, I feel like I get more back. But if I have to pass it through someone, it doesn't always go through that person the same way that I gave it to them. Right, it's lost in translation. Mm -hmm. All right. In the beginning of your career, when you needed guidance and mentorship, were those resources provided for you or did you have to seek them out? And I know you just said that you, it sounds like you got overly mentored. <laughs> I feel like I had to seek them out. And it's because I I honestly feel like you pick your mentor and your mentor picks you. Mm -hmm. But whenever you're in a duty station, like you have somebody that's over you that you may not get along with and this person cannot they can't mentor you, especially if you don't like, you know, how they're living or how they lead. Mm -hmm. So I think you pick, you definitely pick your mentor. I, I had a good mentor in AIT. Okay. Didn't even know what a mentor was at the time, but this man taught us a lot. Like, he would sit down and tell us, like, hey, this is what you need to do to get promoted. Make sure you do this. Make sure you do that. Make sure you do this. And at the time, like, you know, we're new. I was in the Army for three months. I didn't realize it was mentorship, but... He taught me a lot, and then I had an instructor also. That's my mentor now. That mentor didn't, like, I didn't pick him. He picked us. Like, he was <laughs> like, this is my group. I'm going to teach y'all before I retire. But um, my instructor, I picked her as a mentor. Right on, right on. Have you been able to uh, make friends with any black lady veterans? Uh, are you purposeful about building your village? I have. Okay. I would say my, like I said, first duty station, no. <laughs> but here... <laughs> I definitely, like, I, I had a village. They all ended up PCSing, but it was really good, you know. They were always around, around my children. I had a nice little village. Right on. Do you, and you keep in touch with them? Yeah, we talk all the time, right every on. day. Glad to hear it. All right, that, that felt good to hear. Is there a story that you can tell me where you were tested but came out on top? And we can skip this one if you don't want to. So I got picked for a mission. Come on. From the beginning, it was a test because I'm a single mother. Mm -hmm. I don't think I really made a good impression. I wouldn't say made a good impression. Me and my supervisor at the time, we were not on the best of terms. So she was like, out of all the people that were stationed with us, she was like, you're going. And it was me being away from my kids for, it was like three and a half weeks to a month. And they're in school. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to send them with their dad while I go do this mission. Because at this point, they're not giving me a choice. It was like, either this or they're going to start looking at separation. Wow. 
So I went out there with the like the most negative mindset ever because I was like, man, you know how to give up my kids. They're going to school in another place. And she pretty much did this because we don't get along or because we don't speak. Like, that's that's how I felt the whole time. This, the supervisor that sent you? Yes. Did she look like you? Yes. God damn. <laughs> But, you know... We taking L's left and right on this one, <laughs> I had people telling me, like, just, you know, make the best of it. And it took a long time. I was probably out there, like, a week and a half, almost two weeks before I started seeing, like, the positive in it. Because it felt so pointless. Because mm-hmm. we went out there with no materials. It's, you know, raining. It's snowing. It's We're in the woods. It's hot. There's ticks everywhere. I'm not used to being outside. <laughs> but it ended up being a good experience because, like, they gave me a lane that... You know, had we started with nothing, mm-hmm. and we would go out there make something. They'd be like, "No, tear it down, start over. Tear it down, start over." Like every day, it was like tear it down, start over. And then finally, like everybody out there that was on the same lane as me, we all came together. We ended up putting something together, and it turned out great. Like, nice. It was worth it. And then you know, we all got awards for putting in work for it. Nice. So, and then when I got back, she was like, "See, I told you it was gonna be something good." <laughs> But yeah, that is not the less you straddle our. Yeah, no, no. we we end up having to talk about that. Like I was like, there's ways to get people to do. Like there's ways to push people in the right direction. They just gotta learn. She she didn't know how to speak to people either. So is that, the that was one of those leadership? things. I think she had a lot of bad leadership that pointed her in the direction that she's in. Mm. So I can't really blame her per se, but. And I can't blame other people prior to that. It's just it's just a lesson. Like, I feel like she learned the lesson she needed to learn before she left this place. She just had to be open to conversation. So I think it changed her mindset. I hope she's a better person for it. I hope so, too. What is your rank? Like, how high up are you? And you don't have to say if you don't want to. Low, low, low. I'm an E5. <laughs> Sergeant. That's that's not incredibly low. That's fine. It's it's good. It's a little bit. A little something. <laughs> Do you feel that the way you have been treated has improved with rank? I think so. For the most part, yeah. I think there's more responsibility. Like I I think kind of the higher you climb, once you're above E4, they start looking at you. Because, you know, now we got people under us. So Mm -hmm. now they're looking at us like, oh, well, you're, you know, your soldier messed up here, so that's on you. Which is, in all reality, that's the truth because, you know. These are my soldiers I'm supposed to overlook mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or look at everything that they're they're sending up or everything, like all the work that they do. So I feel like it's it's definitely more responsibility. Okay. So treatment has improved, but so has uh responsibility. <laughs> I think I think treatment improvement it depends on the person. Like if you let people run over you and they will if they <laughs> want to, or if you leave the door open for that, mm-hmm. then that's the way you're gonna be treated your entire career. Right on, right on. If you don't, then you're going to, I feel like respect is automatically given. I would give everybody respect until they give me a reason not to. So respect is earned. Do you feel that the improvement of your treatment would have happened sooner had you been a different race and gender? I think for a lot of people that's the case, but I'm I'm mean. So (laughs) I don't, I don't let a lot get by me at work and I definitely speak up, so... That may be a reason for how people try to treat me, but I don't know. I, I really never had any issues with somebody just blatantly just treating me bad, and I'm just like, oh, like, I think I'm going to get out because this is too much. They're so mean at work, but no, it's not. It just depends on the person, your mentality, and I guess how much you want to do, t- like how how bad do you want to finish 20 years? Like, do you want to finish 20 years getting treated bad or, you know, tossed to the side or put in a corner that's how you're gonna be treated but I think for some I like speaking to other black women in the military like not just army but Mm -hmm. anywhere I think they do feel like race plays a part in treatment Mm -hmm. also gender if you talk to a male in any you know any service Mm -hmm. they'll say oh you know women get they get it a lot easier (laughs) it doesn't even really matter about the race but they treat women softer women get buy with this and they get by with this and they get promoted faster so it just depends on a person and their mindset I don't think my race has really played a part in you know how far I've gotten or how far I'll go right on right on y'all she's she's called herself mean but like her voice is so soft I had to shove this microphone up right to her face (laughs) like 
We, we readjusted the mic seven times. <laughs> <laughs> Has there ever been a tough situation where you were in where another black lady helped you out? Or a, no, a tough situation where you helped another black lady out? It's been a lot of situations with me helping someone else out. Like like I said, I got a lot of black soldiers, so right on. I be I be fighting for them to get what they deserve, so they don't feel you know left out or feel like the army is not for black people or black women. And I feel like there's there's been a lot of situations where black women have helped me out. Also, like you know, right on. She's she's done even the small things she's done like leave an impact because she does everything with good intentions. Like she has a pure heart, so. She does. Like, even, like, the, you know, the volunteering thing. Like, I know it's something that help. It's something that benefits her, but she's also trying to, you know, pull in our branch also mm-hmm. to get that exposure. So so what I got out of this is, so far, you're a really good leader. You're, you said you speak enough for the uh, people lower ranking than you, right? I try to be. You, you fight for them. You know that they sometimes might be shy or whatever, and they don't, uh, you speak up for them. So would you say that you are a better leader than the leaders you came up under? I don't think that is a, a answer or a answer for me to give. I feel like we all have our own leadership styles, mm-hmm. and I feel like what they were doing at the time, they felt like they were doing their best. So I can't really—I don't know if I can cuss. But I can't really shit on them and use all the profanities. <laughs> shit on them in the way that they decided to come up. I, I do feel like I developed my leadership style to, you know, mold to my soldiers, mm-hmm. and I think it's you know it's ever changing. Like, I got to be different with this soldier or this soldier or this soldier. Just everybody needs something different. You just got to know them and know what they need to That's get where they need leadership. to go. Yeah. You're, you're describing really good leadership. Good for you. Thank you. For sure. I hope you're proud of yourself. <laughs> she pat herself on the back, y'all. <laughs> Tell me something you wish you had known before joining the service. Mm. Maintaining your individuality. Like, because I do feel like at some point, some places that you go to, like basic training, you, you do as you're told. You, you know, they're, they're instilling discipline, so it's like do this, do this, do this, do this. You really don't have to think about much, but kind of, you know, just maintaining your individuality and being able to work as a group, you know, work, be a team person. Because I think that was my issue. Like I came in, I didn't really have that discipline. Um, and then when they're trying to, like, force discipline down your throat, you know, at an older age, you're like, no, like, I'm not going for that. So you, you know, I wouldn't really say I bucked back, but <laughs> I wasn't the easiest person to train. I mean, you did say you were mean, so I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Just a little bit. Just a little mean. But I, I would say just, you know, for the younger me, like, private me, to, to be able to listen and know that although somebody may not have the best intentions for you, like, they've been there already. Mm-hmm. And just take what you can from that wisdom that they're giving you. Heard that. I don't know if we uh, said this while uh, while we were recording, but um, she did say that she joined the army after a long time after high school. I, I think did we cover that? Five years. Five years after high school, so she was in her twenties when she joined the uh, the military. So it's it's kind of hard to buck a person in their uh, or push a person around in their mid twenties, as opposed to someone who was just fresh out of high school and just got through listening to teachers push them around uh, for 12 years. Tell me about a time you learned a lesson that you may not have been ready to learn. That's my whole career. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think, I feel like the (laughs) army taught me, I feel like sometimes, or maybe I came up as a selfish person, but you know, not everything is about me. Like, I don't have to voice my opinion on everything. And I feel like that's kind of a hard lesson because depending on how the information comes across or how you say it could put you in a world of trouble. I feel like my mouth has got me in trouble a lot. <laughs> but <clears throat> I guess with growth or maturity, in a sense, I wouldn't even really say mature because sometimes I just, things don't even need to be said, but I'm going to say them because I'm like, why? That don't make any sense. <laughs> but kind of just knowing it's a time and a place. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Are there any black lady service members that inspire you? Any sisters in service? Uh, they could be retired, they could be passed on, they could be uh, active duty, reserve, any black lady service members that have inspired you along the way. Ooh. <laughs> Come on, you got to redeem us. You can't just be like, they was pushing me around and then be like, no, 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 that's all. No, I think we got some very strong, you know, black female leaders, but um, 
our MLS is so small, I can't really tell you which one has impacted me the most. But thinking outside, if I'm outside of it, my first uh, into I see my first my first leader. It was a struggle in the beginning, but like when I went back to ALC, like how highly they spoke of her and how much she's grown. Like it was, I think, if anybody made an impact from where we started to where she is now, definitely her. Now, let's say you were just starting out your life right now and you had never been in the military at all. And you were presented with the opportunity to join. Knowing what you know now, would you still join the military? Talking about right now? Yeah. If you had never been in the military right now and you were presented with the opportunity to join, knowing what you know now, would you still join? I would join, but I would not come in as enlisted, especially not at the age I am now. Okay. That's a setback. <laughs> I make more money as a civilian. But, yeah, I, I think I'd still join. Like, I I enjoy being in the Army. Mm-hmm. Right on. I don't think it was a bad decision at all. Good. If you had a daughter or any young, impressionable black girl in your life that you cared about and she was considering a life in the military, would you try to talk her out of it or try to talk her further into it? I would let her make her own decision. I would definitely tell her pros and cons for me before she decided to go to a recruiting station, Mm -hmm. but um, also talk about, like, goals and aspirations they had outside, you know, this being the only choice, Mm -hmm. and either point them in the right direction school-wise if they want to be a nurse or a lawyer or I don't know. I think it's definitely their decision, but the only thing I can do is tell them the pros and cons. Can't really make that decision for them. But just starting out, Mm -hmm. if you're trying to get free school or whatever, you know, it's (laughs) it's not a bad decision as long as you pick the right job. All right. Recruitment and re- retention is down across all of the branches and with all de- demographics. Black women are not excluded from that. This was true even before the pandemic. Why do you think black women are so disinterested in joining the military? Um. <laughs> I stumped her, y'all. I got her. I would say, you know, <laughs> racism definitely plays a part. I do feel like we still have some kinks to work out for years like some years worth of kinks to work out there and then also like talking to black women you know that I grew up with I went to school with and they're like I don't know how you did it because my mouth and it's like I was just as bad as you if not worse (laughs) and if I can do it I think it's um it's mentality of why black women don't want to join the military nobody wants they they feel like all we do is get told what to do we get yelled at we get you know harassed or whatever Everybody has a different experience. I've had a favorable experience in the military. I don't think it's been 100% bad. It hasn't been all good, but like I said, it's, it all has to do with mentality. If you were conducting this interview from where I'm sitting, what question would you ask you that I have not asked you yet? Mm, what I miss? I think all your questions are very well thought out. I don't know what, I don't know what to add. You got me thinking, so. (laughs) All right. Is there anything you would like to leave our audience with? It's going to sound real corny, but kind of just, you know, be true to you. Don't let, I guess, anyone change the the person that you are. Maintain your individuality. And if you're going to change, make sure it's something that you want to do and it's something that's conducive to, you know, where you're going career-wise or just in life in general. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, food inspector. (laughs) Thank you so much for sitting down with me. Thank you for sharing time and coming here and doing this. This was, like, I appreciate your time. Thank you. For sure, for sure. This is good. All right, well, that kind of wraps us up. Um, I'm going to go ahead and shut this thing off. Thanks again, and have a great day, y'all. You too. And that concludes this episode of the Season Vet Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. And a special thank you to the Army Sergeant for sharing her story and taking the time to make this interview possible. Now, if you are or know a Black Lady veteran who would like to sit down with me and be a part of this show, please email me at seasonvetpodcast at gmail.com. Or you can call or text message me at 713-254-0970. You can also find, follow, and inbox me, the Season Vet, across all platforms of social media at Real Season Vet on Twitter, at Season Vet Podcast on Instagram, at Season Vet Podcast on TikTok, at Season Vet on YouTube, Season Vet on Facebook. 
Y'all, I'm so out there, I'm even on Spoutable. That's at the season vet on Spoutable. Now, if you like what you heard, please like it, share it, rate it, and leave a good review on whatever platform you're listening to this on. And if you're hearing this episode on the day that it drops, then you're listening to it on the seventh year anniversary of NFL player Colin Kaepernick beginning his famous silent protest of racial injustice and police brutality. This protest started a trend of protesting across American sports, including the NFL, the NBA, and soccer. Thank you again for tuning in. And until next time, fall out.